Greetings and welcome to Maple Leaf America. We're in St. Louis, Missouri, the home of the blues. This week, a spectacular show, an extensive hockey conversation with former Maple Leaf and the head coach of the blues, Joel Quenville. Plus, we'll take you up in the big arch, the famous arch, 630 feet off the ground, and an up-close look at the United Hockey League, headquartered nearby. Come on back, Maple Leaf America is next. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. We're outside the Savas Center, the home of the St. Louis Blues. And it's the office for this week's Maple Leaf alum, the coach of the St. Louis Blues, Joel Quenville. He won a Stanley Cup in 96 as an assistant coach with Colorado. He won the Jack Adams Award as coach of the year in St. Louis in 2000. And he battled along the blue line for 13 seasons in the NHL. Who is this guy named Herbie? Both got drafted that year to Toronto, Bobby Pront and I uh, from Windsor. And uh, I think Lan in our first training camp uh, came up to us and said, uh, so I asked Bobby, he says, he's got to have a nickname. What's his nickname? I didn't really have a nickname, so he just came up. We can call him Herbie. So Lanny was uh, one of the only guys in Leafs then that called me Herbie. So I got traded to Colorado with Lanny, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, everybody thinks I'm Herbie. And it didn't, it, it's the only place it kind of stuck was in Colorado, but uh, you know, you, you run around and you see Rammer, you see Johnny Wensink, they're the Chico Rush the other day in Jersey, it's almost, so they're the only guys that know me or call me Herbie. Despite all of the accolades, Herbie's career highlight, of course, had to be playing for the Colorado Rockies from 1979 to 82. <laughs> well, we've put a few coaches out of business. we put an organization out of business, but it was a great place to play. Everybody enjoyed going to Colorado, being in Colorado and playing there. The only tough part was our uh, beat our record or the constant change. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I was happy to see uh, the NHL go back there. I was fortunate enough to be a part of that when it returned, and uh, we had some good success upon the getting back there, but uh, during our days as a young kid and as a young organization, it was still, uh, I don't think anybody was uh, disappointed uh, with playing there. I just uh, think that uh, maybe we either weren't good enough or we just didn't give enough time to uh, get stabilized. Well, we were aptly named. Our nickname was Rocky Hockey, and it was certainly Rocky. We didn't win a lot of games, but we were a close-knit group. Uh, you know, we went through a lot of adversity, a lot of losses, and the guys that did manage to stick together there uh, were a close-knit group just part of the learning and growing process that turns a player into a solid coach. As long as you're yourself and uh, you know you get your point across, I, you, I can look back and, uh, and you could probably ask everybody, every guy I played with, that I'd probably be the least expected guy to be a coach. Probably one of those guys that you know, was probably you know, loosey-goosey type of guy as a player and then they're sitting there, he's a coach. And uh, a Rammer will set, tell you that for sure. But it's a... Uh, you know, I just think as long as you're yourself and you're, uh, and don't try to um, be somebody you're not, because uh, the players are pretty uh, astute as far as uh, recognizing things like that. Quenville's players agree. Honest and informed seem to be the two qualities that matter most in a coach. Add hard work and competitiveness, and he's in pretty good shape. At times, even kill. At times, I think you'll see him uh, lose it a little bit back there, but uh, you know, I think for the most part, uh, you see an even kill guy back there that wants his team to win uh, very badly. You know, I think having been uh, on a winning team in Colorado and, and kind of seen the maturation process that team went through, you know, being uh, you know low man on the totem pole uh, for a number of years in, in Quebec and then moving to Colorado and winning their first year, I think it was uh, something he got a lot of uh, you know respect out of. It's great having a, a defenseman. Uh, he knows the game so well, both uh, you know through a forward's eyes and a defenseman's eyes. So it's great for me because I can learn so much. He knows uh, so many small tricks, and, and uh, I mean it, it's been such a, a transition for me coming from the AHL to here. And uh, he's been able to, 
to just simplify things for me and help me make the game that much easier. As a player, all you really ask is uh, for a coach to be fair and uh, you know and, and give you an opportunity when you deserve it. And uh, Joel certainly does that. And, you know, it's uh, guys want to go to work for him. I'm not in it as a popular, being a popular guy or in a popularity contest. I'm in a, there to win hockey games and try to get the best out of each and every player. Um, I think this year has been a little bit more trying uh, than other years because it's been a first year where we've kind of been fluctuating between a good performance and a poor one and it's been uh, more trying and uh, I think that uh, whether you, you don't care how uh, it's being received as long as you uh, get your message across that it's unacceptable. Uh, we've had a lot of success so it's, uh, I don't think there's been a lot of need to, uh, to get uh, irritable but at the same time I think we're pretty consistent in our message and uh, sometimes you try to get it away in a sterner fashion than other times, but at the same time, as long as you're clear and uh, we have everybody doing the same things, uh, is our objective. But turning knowledge and savvy into long-term success usually requires other intangibles. He's a very smart individual, and he sees the ice very well. He, he sees everything on the ice. I can't believe it. I'll watch the video, and I don't see as much as he does on the ice. And. Uh, uh, he's able to pick out things all the time and, and, and different little things, you know, and uh, so he sees the game quite well and he's able to make adjustments right away. And he's not afraid to make adjustments and uh, he'll make them, you know, after uh, two, three, four shifts right into the game. And, uh, and so which is, which is a, a, a great asset for a coach to have. Being a former defenseman, he definitely helps us out a lot. He knows, uh, has been in a lot of different situations that we've been in. And, uh, and understands the game and, and how you learn from them, and, and especially when you bring in young guys like Van Ryan and, and Salvador, uh, you know, you, pl you play them with supposed seasoned veterans like myself and, and Al, and, and try to bring them along that way. And I, I think he understands that uh, at one point he was a young player in the league and, and was probably paired, paired with a, an older player. And, you know, it's, it's nice to kind of have a, a mentor tutor uh, relationship with your defense partner. So, how did all this develop? It surely wasn't a given for Quenville. Well, Joel and I were, you know, a year apart. We played junior hockey against each other, so there was some familiarity when he came over from the Leafs. Uh, we were partners for a while. We were uh, roommates. He was a free spirit. He was a, a fun-loving guy, great sense of humor, and there was a serious side to him also. He took his hockey seriously. But uh, to think that he was going to be a, a head coach in the National Hockey League at that time, no way. Maybe it was destiny. Check out these kids from Quenville's youth and bantam teams in Windsor. Quite a group. NHL. 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 Jeez. Good player over in uh, Germany. NHL. Impressive. Unfortunately, as young street and ice hockey players in southern Ontario in the 60s, these guys didn't necessarily yeah, grow up Leafs year, fans. Brace yourself. Mostly Montreal Canadian fans back then, and we had a lot of Leaf fans and Detroit fans. They didn't have as many, but I always was a Chicago Blackhawk fan. I grew up, uh, well, Bobby, Bobby Hall was my idol, so I uh, was one of the few that uh, had to support uh, Chicago, or at least. Uh, but, I, you know, I was, I was Bobby Hall. Everybody was either Jean Beliveau or uh, Davy Keon or Gordie Howe, but it was always fun back then uh, knowing that you'd be out in the street uh, all hours of the spring or all hours in the winter time when you're out on the rink, so it was a, uh, it was a fun, fun place to grow up. Quenville grew up into an outstanding defenseman for the Windsor Spitfires. Drafted by the Leafs in the first round in 1978, his game gradually turned from offensive to more stay at home. Went to training camp, uh, things worked out pretty well, started uh, most of the season a couple times up and back uh, in Moncton, and then uh, getting a chance to play there the rest of the year was, uh, was a big thrill. But uh, certainly, uh, I think there's expectations from the club for you to come out and, uh, and, uh, and help your team, well, hopefully immediately. And, uh, and I worked out pretty, uh, I was there pretty quick. Um, but at the same time, we had expect, I had expectations of, uh, of trying to make the National Hockey League sooner than later also. Being paired with Hall of Famer Borea Salming didn't hurt the kid coming out of the blocks. But Toronto is an organization in transition. Quenville kept a stiff upper lip despite being shipped to Colorado with Lanny McDonald after only 93 games with the Leafs. At a young age, you don't realize uh, be, what trading is all about. And, uh, you know, I was just an opportunity to play again. And I thought that uh, going to Colorado would have been fun and uh, would have been the uh, same situation. It worked out all right. I know that uh, we, uh, we didn't win at the same rate that they did in Toronto. But I don't know what, during that same period, Toronto went through significant change. And, uh, 
you know, Daryl and everybody had uh, was was being moved, and uh, that whole transition. I was probably at the the beginning of it all, but uh, in Colorado we went through similar change, and uh, that was part of it. But uh, certainly felt uh, pretty fortunate to have a chance to play and grow up, uh, starting with the Leafs. After two trades during the summer of 1983, Quenville ended up in Hartford. He spent a bulk of his career, seven seasons, with the Whalers. Twice he earned Team Defenseman of the Year honors, and in 1987, Hartford won a division title. Quenville shoots, he scores! Didn't quite get to the top, but uh, you know, good memories there. It was a great fan base. Uh, you know, the market was very small, so it wasn't easy there to... Uh, to stay, especially in today's uh, marketing or the, the economics of today's game. But I know the people were uh, heartbroken when the team left. We still make uh, Hartford our home in the off season. My wife and their family is uh, is back there, and uh, we uh, we get back there here for, for uh, the summer times. But uh, I know the people there when uh, that last game there was very emotional when the whale did leave. But uh, I have great memories there. I spent more time there than any uh, place I've been in the game, and uh, closing on that gap now now in St. Louis. On January 7th, Quenville reached his fifth anniversary as coach of the Blues. He and his wife, Boo, or Elizabeth, have enjoyed success since moving to Missouri. But a year 2000 President's Trophy is not a Stanley Cup. That was an outstanding season for us. I think uh, we, uh, we may have overachieved as a team, but at the same time, uh, we were so consistent every night. Same, 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 same. And, uh, I think we got better as a team as we went along, and we had a disappointment of losing in the first round. But that was a that was a great season, and uh, it was a it was a fun all around uh, year. Last season, the Blues were plagued by injuries. This season, the team started slowly, but turned it on after the new year. Staying healthy and peaking at the right time could mean a cup. What fun! No wonder Quenville loves his job. It's a great job. I love it, and I think uh, if you had to compare compare playing to coaching, I think you'd have to always say playing is the best because it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's something, it's, it's like you're playing and it's fun. It's a little bit more of a uh, job as a coach, um, but it's, it's almost like you are playing, it's a game, we're playing to win, you can, you know, you can measure your performances by winning and losing, it's a, uh, you can evaluate, uh, you know, how you're doing. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's the, the fun part about it. You still have that competitiveness in you, winning and, and, and losing and, and, and trying to find ways to, to get the job done. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great job, and I feel very fortunate to, to coach at this level. And, and the organization's been great to work with. And I'm surrounded by some great coaches, uh, Jimmy Roberts and Mike Kitchen, so that, uh, that can only help. Call him Q, call him Herbie, call him whatever. Head coach Joel Quenville would love the Blues to be called champions. There's almost 18,000 people in this building and I can't find one person from Ontario. I've walked around the entire place. I've gotten a lot of scowls and a lot of dirty comments, but not one friendly greeting. Oh well, we'll be back with more Maple Leaf America right after this. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America in St. Louis. Man, I am really tall. Well, maybe not that tall, at least not in comparison to the Jefferson Expansion Memorial. It's history and art all rolled into one. It's the famous St. Louis Arch, and we're taking a closer look at it right now. No one associated with Maple Leaf America had ever visited the Arch, so this was pretty exciting. A chance to gawk at it, and holy smokes, a chance to ride up to the top. Old hat for the locals. I'm from St. Louis, so I've always taken family and friends from out of town there, and it's just where we always go. It's a good starting point. I could give the tour of the Arch. I know all of the, the animals in there, and the, uh, and the, the tram, and the picking out, you know, the places of the city when you look down from above, and oh yeah, I could give tours. I've been in there dozens, many times. Well, she should never lose an appreciation. It's wonderful, yet weird. Depending on where you stand, optical illusions abound. The arch's legs actually stand the exact same distance apart as the arch is high. In other words, width and height are the same, 
at 192 meters. Is astounding, I think, because it was unique in the way that it was built, and it's also like a, a piece of artwork, a piece of outdoor sculpture. So it's, it's an engineering feat, it's a construction feat, and it's also like a piece of art. Riding to the top of this piece of art involves stepping into a surreal half-train, half-elevator pod. It took two and a half years to build the thing, and it seems to take almost that long to get to the top, just due to the bizarre mode of transportation. Once up, a modern view of Eastern, and of course, Western America. It's unreal. Explorers left from here, the fur trade was really big here. A lot of the westward emigrants that went in the covered wagons left from St. Louis. So it was just thought that, you know, St. Louis was the gateway to the West, and they wanted to memorialize that. So when it came time to design an actual monument to westward expansion, they really chose the perfect symbol because it's an actual gateway, it's an actual portal through which people can pass. For intellectuals only, this steel and concrete shape is considered catenary. For the rest of us, just mesmerizing. The best thing about the arch is because I have a daughter that's five years old, and to her the arch means that she's in St. Louis. We can be riding on the highway or coming from out of town, we're in St. Louis. There goes St. Louis because she's seen the arch. Um, the Arch is one of the places that I go every year. To me, uh, my kids are out on spring break, and that is one trip we make to the Arch every year. We love it. It's in St. Louis. That's just a landmark for us. For the bourgeoisie. The Arch grounds are very beautiful, and there are lots of times activities that go around on the riverfront that are centered by the Arch. And then, as I mentioned, fun cocktail parties in the museum portion of the Arch. <laughs> Good thing the cocktail parties are downstairs. Heading up could get queasy. It's a gravity defier. An engineering one of a kind completed in 1965. All because Thomas Jefferson decided to buy land from France in 1803 and double the country's size. The Arch, AKA the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. Tell you what, that arch is pretty remarkable. You know what else is remarkable? The fact that this is the seventh week of the show and I still do not have the name and number on the back of my Leafs jersey. We've been on the road so much, I've not been able to pull anything off. It's been just a great big hassle and I'm resorting to whatever I can here. I'm thinking if I had some tweezers and maybe some paint or maybe some whiteout, I could just kind of snip right around the, and take the... <sighs> We'll be right back. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. Through what we like to call the magic of television, I am now in Port Huron, Michigan. I know it's the Missouri show, but the United Hockey League stretches from way down there to all the way up here. What is the United Hockey League? The United League is the fourth and final quote unquote double A pro league that Maple Leaf America has taken a glance at this season. The 11-year-old 14-team circuit arguably has the least amount of talent depth in the minors. It's also the one that's had to work the hardest the last few years to clean up its reputation. The intensity of the hockey is pretty well the same, you know, the caliber of hockey is the same. Uh, the, the craziness, the roughness is, is, is toned down quite a bit. Uh, like I was here, I played in this league seven years ago and uh, it wasn't unusual to see guys uh, spearing guys in the face, uh, guys purposely trying to break, you know, other guys' arms and stuff like that. Uh, there was one game I... A guy off my own team went down the bench, down the uh, visiting bench, and hacked probably the first six guys over the head with the stick. Uh, it, it, it was it was definitely out of a hand, and it was you know every, everything that you heard about uh, the horror stories were all true. Um, but the, it's just like any other league now, uh, it's just like the East Coast, West Coast. It's uh, it's you know it's a good caliber of hockey, and uh, you know they they definitely did a good job in toning it down. I think it has a pretty good reputation. Um, I think this year, if you look at the stats, the teams are all good, and uh, it's a close race. Um, you know, I think the IHL had a bad rep about 12 years ago, and now then it was a great league, and now now it's part of the American League. So it shows that uh, any league can survive as long as there's good hockey and a lot of fans. Much of the credit for the cleanup goes to league president Richard Brossel, who instilled a no-nonsense approach to on-ice bad behavior when he took over in 1997. 
flagrant fouls are down, the penalties are down, uh, the stick work is down. Um, that's something that when I came into this league, this league really did not have that type of reputation. It had a goon hockey reputation. Uh, uh, many people in our industry have called me, you know, uh, Captain Hook because I'm real, real quick to ban a player, but I stand by it and I, I respect the game of hockey and I expect the players to do the same. So two willing combatants want to drop the gloves, I don't have a problem with that, but if they start swinging their sticks or go for cheap shots and go after somebody with the intent to injure them, they're not going to play in the United Hockey League. The year he arrived, Brossel also brought about the name change to United League from Colonial League. Unfortunately, identity remains a problem. In the last 10 years, not a season has gone by in which a team hasn't moved, gone dormant, or folded. Thus, maybe one reason for the UHL nickname, the U-Haul. When they're traveling 9, 10, 11 hours on a bus every night to go to their next destination, it doesn't make for A, good hockey, nor does it make for a good cost structure and controlling your costs. So we'd like to ultimately have all of our teams uh, that whether we have two conferences or we end up having three divisions, which, you know, whatever it plays out, that no team would be traveling any more than five or six hours on a bus. And, and that, that would allow us to recreate the glory days of an, of an IHL. And does it really matter the caliber of play compared to other leagues? Probably not, as long as fans in this traditional hockey region continue to enjoy the action and fill the seats. Kevin Fitzpatrick believes in the UHL. His group recently purchased the Missouri River Otters. Projected ourselves really is their farm system for fans. What we're trying to do is attract uh, families or, or people that uh, have never really gone to a hockey game that can come and, and our average ticket price is eight to ten dollars. So you can bring a family of four for thirty-two to forty dollars, see a game, and hopefully you know, we put on a pretty good show and, and uh, they, they go help. I can go down the road 20 minutes and see the best in the world play. So we, we really feel like we're almost a farm system from the fan perspective to uh, get people interested in the game, come out and have a good experience, and then eventually go to a Blues game. It's a cheap ticket. Um, it's close to home. We don't have to drive all the way downtown. Um, I think it's a good thing for the kids, too, because they get more involved and they get involved in hockey. So, you know, it's a much more better thing. For the NHL, it's expensive to take your kids to. Since I opened this up, I've got season tickets now. and I love it. I'm here for every game. Fort Wayne forward Chad Grills should be the poster boy for the UHL. The victim of a stick-swinging incident a couple years ago, he stuck around a league that's dramatically improved. For me personally, you know, it's probably staying home uh, close to my wife. Uh, you know, obviously you, you want to make a lot of money, but, uh, you know, to be close to your family and friends is uh, very important to me. And, uh, you know, obviously I've played in this league for seven years now, and, uh, you know, I've been around Michigan and Indiana really close to where, where my roots are, so uh, it's worked out well. The ever-changing United Hockey League. In general, Ontario's closest double-A neighbor. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Maple Leaf America. We've had a great time here in Missouri tonight in St. Charles with the River Otters and their fans like Lindsay, who's really enjoying the action. Next week, we're going west again. So join us. We'll see you then on Maple Leaf America.